focus your mind on the breath. Try to be on good terms with the breath. After all, it's the energy of life. And if the energy is feels healthy, feels nourishing, it's going to nourish both the body and the mind. It's probably the most important thing in life, and yet we very rarely look at it. We're always concerned about other things. People, places, work, responsibilities. So it's good to have some time where this is our only responsibility, and for the time being you can be the only person you have to worry about. Look after yourself. It may sound selfish, but it's not. The better you look after yourself in the right way, the less of a burden you are on other people and the more you can actually help them. You've probably seen that little video they have on airplanes, and they say when the oxygen masks come down, always make sure you put your mask on first, and then put the, put the mask on people around you who need help. If you're coming from a position of strength, it's easier to help other people. And when you can find strength from inside, you're less of a burden on them. So here's one area where there's a lot of untapped resources. The energy of the breath and the body. Think of it going through the whole body as you breathe in, the whole body as you breathe out. Massaging every cell of your body, energizing every cell of your body. The areas that are tense, think of them dissolving away in the breath. so that every part of you can be nourished by the breathing. This is a very important principle in finding true happiness. In the Buddha's analysis of suffering, he says if you breathe in ignorance, that's one of the causes for suffering. If you think in ignorance, If you label your perceptions, label your experiences in ignorance, it all leads to suffering. So here's an opportunity to do all of this with awareness. You breathe with awareness, think about the breath with awareness, and label the different sensations in the body as they relate to the breath with awareness. It cuts back on the causes of suffering, and there's so much unnecessary suffering in our lives. Years back, during one of the commemorations for a John Lee's passing, the very last day of a three-day event, they had invited a, a monk from Bangkok to come out and give a sermon. And because of the traffic, he couldn't get there in time. So they grabbed somebody else to give the sermon in his stead. And so the person who was pinch hitting gave a long talk on how the Buddha's teachings were all about suffering, understanding suffering. And then just as he finished, the original monk came and arrived. So he got to give a sermon, too. We had a long marathon that afternoon. And his talk, he hadn't heard the first talk, his talk was all about how the Buddha's teachings were all about happiness. And they're both right. The Buddha focused on suffering, because if you want to be happy, you have to understand suffering. And if you want to be happy, you have to understand happiness. We have so many misunderstandings around these things. But if you understand them, then you can find true happiness in the midst of all the aging, illness, and death of the world. The causes of suffering, the Buddha said, come from within. And we can also make the causes of happiness come from within. And when happiness comes from within, that means that your happiness doesn't have to conflict with anybody else's. For most of us, happiness means gaining wealth, gaining power, gaining status, grabbing at beauty, 
And there's only a limited number amount of these things in the world. There's not really enough to go around. When you gain wealth, someone else is going to lose. When you gain power, other people lose their power. When you gain status, somebody else is pushed out of that status. And so on down the line. And if your idea of happiness depends on gaining things like that, then it's going to inevitably lead to conflict. It's going to be unstable. Because if your gain means someone else is lost, they're going to do what they can to gain what they've lost back. But if you understand that happiness comes from within, it comes from developing your own inner resources, things as simple as the breath. That puts you in a very different position with regard to the people around you. Your happiness doesn't have to conflict with theirs, but your happiness can actually help theirs. If you know how to find true happiness inside, cultivate your breath, cultivate your thoughts in the proper way. You can be a good example of them, and you can actually share your knowledge with them at the appropriate times. And you've probably noticed people who have that kind of glow from an inner happiness. You pick up some of that glow just being around them. So you create a better environment for the people in your family, the people at work. Because you're cultivating good things inside. There are three basic principles, generosity, virtue, and meditation. And all three have to work together. It is possible to be generous and not be very happy about it, especially when you think you're being generous in hopes of getting something back from the people that you're benefiting. And you start getting impatient about well, when the result's going to come. This is what the meditation is for: is to remind you we're here to we're being generous because it's good for the mind in and of itself. That's the reward right there. It helps to cleanse the mind of its greed. And develop a sense of the needs of other people and how good it feels to help other people. When you have something and they lack and you're able to fill up the lack for them. And it so happens that when you're generous, other people will be generous with you. But the prime purpose of the generosity is to cleanse the mind. To open up the mind, to make the mind broader. It's like living in a house. If you're living in a very narrow room, it's very confining. But if you're living in a wide open room with lots of sunlight and lots of space, you're very comfortable. It's the same with the mind. If your mind is greedy and acquisitive, it's narrow, it's confining. All you can think about is how little you have and how much more you want, and how you're afraid that what you've got is going to be get taken away. And that gets very confining, very narrow. But if you realize that the goodness you've done by being generous, that doesn't get taken away. And you can live in a world where they have fires, and they have floods, and they have storms, and your good inner possessions are not affected by the fires or floods or storms. And the same way you find a way to connect with other people. So you not only have a wide open house inside your own mind. But other people are happy to open their houses to you. So the mind gains a greater sense of spaciousness by cultivating the virtue of generosity. Then there's the virtue of the precepts. This also is a kind of a gift. The Buddha says if you make up your mind that you're not going to kill anybody at all, you're not going to steal anything from anybody at all, not engage in, in illicit sex with anybody at all, so on down the line. You're not going to lie to anybody. You're not going to take intoxicants at all. 
He says, you're giving total safety to other beings. That there's nobody out there who has to be afraid of you. And then you're going to get a part of that safety as well. And so you begin to see the power of your own actions by being generous, by being virtuous. You create a different world around yourself. Spacious, secure. And that gives you the opportunity to focus directly in on the mind. So you can see what the mind is doing that's causing suffering, the kind of suffering that goes deep down inside. The mind has the opportunity to sit here and meditate, to get quiet. Once it's quiet, you can really see what's going on. You begin to see the movements of the mind, the ways in which you create unnecessary suffering and stress simply by the way you think about things, even about the way you breathe. What it comes down to is seeing, looking at things in terms of cause and effect, and what's skillful and unskillful. What actions, what words, what thoughts are skillful in the sense of not causing harm, not causing a sense of burden. This is the important set of criteria to use. As the Buddha once said, the beginning of wisdom is when you ask that question, what, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? So the focus is on the power of your actions and the results that you get. And then learning from the results, if they're not satisfactory, will change what you do. It sounds very simple. But most people, when they come to Buddhism, want something more abstract, something more esoteric. And they miss this very basic, essential question. The beginning of wisdom, what, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? And so you look at your external actions, you look at your words, and you begin to look at the movements of your mind. Because you begin to understand that it's the movements of your mind that are causing all the trouble inside. The world outside is simply the way it is. Things are in constant stressful not-self. And yet we, if we try to lay claim to them and create a happiness out of them, we're asking for trouble. Because we're asking for something from them that they can't give. But if you look inside, you begin to realize, okay, if I develop concentration, if I develop discernment, this enables me to live in the world in a way that minimizes the suffering. Less suffering for myself, less suffering for the people around me. And at the same time, you begin to find a source of happiness inside that's special, that's something separate. And you realize that it doesn't require all that much. We miss this internal source because we're so ignorant. We have so many other issues going on that we don't pay attention to this one question. What am I doing? What are the results? If you pay attention here, you begin to find things opening up. You can learn new ways of acting and speaking and thinking. So in this way, as you come to understand the sources of suffering inside, you also begin to understand what true happiness is. When you understand true happiness, it's a lot easier to live in the world with compassion, to live in the world with goodwill, sympathetic or empathetic joy. Seeing when other people are happy, you're not jealous of their happiness. Their happiness doesn't diminish you. And you're able to live with equanimity in areas where you can't make any difference in the world. Because you realize well, your happiness doesn't have to depend on things out there. It's more an internal issue. And so when you understand the issues of suffering and understand the issues of happiness, that's what makes happiness possible. even in the midst of this world, with its aging, illness, death, and separation. One of the chants we have here is a reflection of the fact that we're all subject to aging, illness, death, separation. And then, but the last reflection is that we all have our actions. 
we're heirs to our actions, and this is where the hope lies. Learn to look at the way we act and learn from our mistakes. That's the way to find true happiness, even though there's aging, illness, death, and separation all around us. And again, it's not a selfish happiness, it's not an unfeeling happiness. It's a happiness that doesn't place a burden on anyone else. And as I said, when you're more secure in yourself, in your own happiness, it's a lot easier to be a source of strength to others. So keep these points in mind as we go through the activities of tomorrow and you leave the monastery and continue in whatever other, other activities you have in your life. Understand where true happiness comes from. Understand where true suffering comes from. You can put an end to the suffering and you can find a happiness that doesn't change. It's always there when you need it.